Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 3 from the series on Ephesians is titled The Power of the Exalted Jesus, ready for teaching on July 15. It's authored by Dr. John McVeigh and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 8. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We always love to thank you for your word because it means so much to us. And in this series of lessons that we're reading from the book of Ephesians, we just thank you that your grace and your love, your foreknowledge and your power is shown to us. And this week, as we look at your power being exalted in Jesus, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. May our minds be blessed. May our hearts be filled with courage and love because of what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, as we open your word, we pray that our families, our communities and our churches may be blessed. And as we share your love with those about us, may they know that this week we have walked with Jesus. And today I'd like to particularly pray for the staff who listen at the Adventist Noosa Christian College in Karoi in Queensland, Australia, and also for those listening on the Sabbath School and Personal Ministries app right around the world, and for Ed Abbott and Quan Miller and Tinica Reynolds and Christy Decker and Elton March and Alicia Green and her father and Joni Tonkin and Simba Paza and Vanessa Russell, who listens in her car, and Ernest Emanuelson and Shari Quemboy and Rignalo C. Merkman and Victoria Crosby. Lord, wherever we're listening, whether it be in the car or walking or sitting or on the way to work or jogging, Lord, I pray that as we open your word this week, that we will each be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Through the Holy Spirit, believers may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Let's read that again, Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20. Through the Holy Spirit, believers may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Human beings, it seems, are always reaching for more power. Auto manufacturer Devil Motors, for instance, showed off the prototype of its Devil 16, a vehicle with a 16-cylinder, 12.3-litre engine, producing more than 5,000 horsepower. Or, if that is not enough, consider the Peterbilt semi-truck that sports three Pratt & Whitney J34-48 jet engines boasting 36,000 horsepower. The truck does a quarter of a mile in 6.5 seconds and regularly hits 376 miles per hour. That's about 500 kilometres an hour before deploying its two parachutes. In contrast, Paul prays that believers in Ephesus, under temptation to admire the various powers and deities of their culture, will experience through the Holy Spirit the immensity of the power God makes available to them in Christ. This divine might is not measured in horsepower or magic, but is seen in four cosmos-shifting salvation history events. One, the resurrection of Jesus, two, his exaltation at the throne of God, three, all things being placed in subservience to Christ, and four, Christ being given to the church as its head, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 to 23 this week. In considering these four events, believers may begin to grasp and experience the vast scope of the power God exercises on their behalf. (music) 
Sunday, July 9. Praying and Thanksgiving. Motivated by news that believers in Ephesus are thriving in faith toward Jesus and in love toward each other, perhaps news shared by Tychius in Ephesians 6, 21 and 22, Paul reports to them how he prays for them. Let's just read that reference to Tychius. Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 21, But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs, and that he may comfort your hearts. Compare Paul's two prayer reports in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 23, and Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. What themes do the two reports share? First of all, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And chapter 3 in Ephesians, verses 14 to 21. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. Sometimes our default tone in prayer can be doleful, mourning over this challenge or that problem. Paul's prayer reports in Ephesians suggest that thanksgiving is the native language of prayer. We gather up the blessings of God and thank Him for them. We seek to perceive God at work in difficult circumstances and praise Him for His transforming presence in our lives. Celebrating the grace and power of the exalted Jesus, as we read in chapter 1, verses 20 to 23, we thank Him for blessing those in our circle of influence. Here is Paul's transforming secret of prayer. Prayer is is the key of praise and thanksgiving. Paul also said that he does not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. In chapter 1, verse 16, he also talks about this in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you, all with joy. And First Thessalonians 1 and verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And then in First Thessalonians five sixteen to 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
What does it really mean to pray without ceasing, as you read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17? It cannot mean that we are always kneeling before God in prayer. It does mean that, blessed by God's Spirit, we move through life with hearts open to the presence and power of God, seeking cues for thanksgiving to Him. It means a readiness to process the issues of life in the presence of God, to seek divine counsel as we experience the twists and turns that life brings. It means living not in estrangement from God, but in engagement with Him, ever open to divine leading. We too often view prayer as a nicety, an add-on to discipleship that is to be exercised when convenient. Paul illustrates a different view. Paul takes seriously the task of praying for the believers in Ephesus, doing so both by giving thanks for them, in chapter 1, verse 16, and we'll also compare that with uh, what comes before it in verses 3 to 14. Let's have a look at verse 16 first. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then back in Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And he also interceded in Ephesians 1, 17 to 23, which we read earlier, and also Ephesians three fourteen to 21, which we also read as well. For him, prayer is a central or even the central task of faith. These verses provide a moving call to prayer, an invitation for each of us to consider our own prayer ministry in the light of Paul's dedication to it. And so to finish today, why is it important always to thank God in prayer for what you have to be thankful for? Monday, July 10. Experiencing insight from the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 read, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. In reporting his prayers, Paul records one central request that he places before the throne of God. He has already noted that the Holy Spirit has come into believers' lives at the time of their conversion. We read that in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the glory of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now, Paul prays for a fresh blessing of the Spirit to give needed spiritual insight focused on a deepened understanding of Jesus 
in the knowledge of him, as we just read in verse 17. Paul prays that the Holy Spirit will bring special insight to believers on what three topics? Let's read Ephesians 1, verses 17 to 19. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. When Paul prays for insight for them about the hope to which he has called you in verse 18, he prays that they will be alert to the past actions God has already taken for their salvation, as we've read previously this week in verses 3 to 9 and 11 to 13, and to the glorious future he has planned for them that we read about in verses 10 and 14. When he prays for insight into the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, in verse 18, he is recalling the Old Testament idea of believers as God's inheritance. As we read in Deuteronomy 9, verse 29, Yet they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. And Deuteronomy 32, verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. And Zechariah 2, verse 12, And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. And we're going to compare that with verse 11 again, which reads... In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He wishes them to know that they not only possess an inheritance from God, but that they are God's inheritance, and Paul wants them to understand their value to God. When Paul prays for spiritual insight about the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, in verse 19, he imagines the Holy Spirit bringing fresh understanding of the immensity of God's power and actualizing it in their experience. In all these prayers, Paul wants these people to experience for themselves what they have been given in Jesus. And so to finish today, how can you better experience the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, as it said, and what does this mean in daily life? Tuesday, July 11. Participating in Resurrection Power In the remaining verses of Paul's prayer report, Ephesians 1, 20-23, Paul expands on the third topic of insight he hopes that the Holy Spirit will bring to believers, the enormity of God's power which he exercises on their behalf. Paul begins by pointing to two salvation history events as the premier illustrations of God's power. One, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and two, the exaltation of Jesus to the throne of the cosmos. How is God's power expressed through the resurrection of Jesus? And we're going to read several texts. First of all, Ephesians 1, verses 20 to 23 which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 22, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made 
alive. And Philippians 3 verses 8 to 11. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is a non-negotiable belief of the Christian faith, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. And verse 17, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. It is because Christ is risen that faithful believers await the grand future resurrection to eternal life at the time of Christ's return, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. But now... Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. It is because Christ is risen that we can look at him today for all the blessings of the gospel, including the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The imagery that God seated him, Christ, at his right hand in Ephesians 1.20 is drawn from Psalm 110 verse 1, the most frequently cited passage in the New Testament. All of the passages just cited seem to draw on it. Let's read that original one in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The exaltation of Christ has a high profile in Ephesians. Believers are seated with him, Christ Jesus, in the heavenly places, we read in Ephesians 2 verse 6. In addition, Paul refers to the ascent of Christ as a prelude to Christ filling all things and giving gifts to his church, as we read in Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 11. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who had descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. In Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 11, which we've just read, Paul warns us away from adopting a merely static image of Christ on the Father's throne, presenting rather, as F. F. Bruce writes in the Epistles to the Colossians, to Philemon and to the Ephesians, page 133, the dynamic New Testament picture of the exalted Christ going forth by his Spirit in all the world, conquering and to conquer, end of quote. So, Paul portrays the exaltation coronation of Christ not simply as an illustration of the divine power offered to believers, but as the source of that power. So to finish today, 
What are the ways that you need Christ's power in your life, and how can we better avail ourselves of that power? What practices might hinder our access to His power? Wednesday, July 12. Christ above all powers. Paul has celebrated the exaltation of Jesus who now sits with the Father on the throne of the cosmos. Having defined the position of Christ in relationship to the Father, seated at his right hand in the heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians 1.20, Paul turns to the relationship of Jesus to the powers. As co-regent with the Father, Jesus is far above them all, it says in Ephesians 1.21. Compare Paul's mentioning of evil spiritual powers in Ephesians 1.21, Ephesians 2.2, Ephesians 6.12. Why do you think Paul is so interested in these powers? Ephesians 1 verse 21, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And Ephesians 2 verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And Ephesians 6 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Acts 19 verses 11 to 12, with its story of the seven sons of Sceva, illustrates that Ephesus at the time of Paul was a centre for the magic arts. Let's read that story in Acts 19 verses 11 to 20. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practised magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled fifty thousand pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed." Clinton E. Arnold, in Power and Magic, The Concept of Power and Ephesians, page 18, writes, The overriding characteristic of the practice of magic throughout the Hellenistic world was the cognizance of a spirit world experiencing influence over virtually every aspect of life. The goal of the magician was to discern the helpful spirits from the harmful ones and learn the distinct operations and the relative strengths and authorities of the spirits. Through this knowledge, means could be constructed with spoken or written formulas, amulets, etc. for the manipulation of the spirits in the interest of the individual person. With the proper formula, a spirit-induced sickness could be cured or a chariot race could be one. End of quote. The interest in naming deities and powers in spells was a feature of religious life in Ephesus, as we read there in Acts 19.13, and among some even today. Paul wishes to make clear the relationship between Christ and the powers. The exalted Jesus is as it says in Ephesians 1.21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. 
just to be sure that his audience understands that there's no power outside of the sovereignty of Jesus, he adds an allusion to the practice of gathering up the names of deities in spells. In Ephesians 1.21, and above every name that is named, it reads, Turning from the dimension of space to that of time, Paul stresses the unlimited chronology of Jesus' exalted rule. His rule over all powers applies, as it says in verse 21, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And so to finish today, what are some present-day manifestations of these same evil forces? And how can we make sure that we don't get caught up in any of them? Thursday, July 13. Jesus, all things, and his church. Early Christians saw in Psalm 110 verse 1 a prophecy of the exaltation of Jesus. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. They read Psalm 8 in the same way with its affirmation that God has put all things under his feet in verse 6. The feet of the Son of Man in verse 4. While they believed that the powers of darkness in the heavenly places were over their heads and threatened to subjugate them, they laid hold of the truth that those powers were under Christ's feet. Note carefully that having put all things under his, that's Jesus' feet, the Father, as it says in chapter 1 verse 22, gave him as head over all things to the church. And we compare that with the King James Version reading, gave him to be head over all things to the church. While all things is a universal inclusive term, Paul still has in mind the powers mentioned in Ephesians 1.21. All things, the cosmic, supernatural, spiritual powers included, are under the feet of Christ, subservient to him. What benefits does the exaltation of Christ to the throne of the cosmos and his rule over all things in heaven and on the earth provide for his church? Let's read Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God has made Christ victorious over all evil powers. The church, closely identified with Christ and supplied by him with all its needs, is itself guaranteed victory over those foes. The power of God on display in the resurrection and his exaltation over every cosmic power has been activated for the church. God has given the victorious Christ to the church, which is so united with him as to be called his body. How can we believers know the exalted Christ and experience God's power in our lives? Paul does not directly address any mechanisms or strategies by which this occurs. However, the fact that the passage is part of a prayer report is suggestive. Paul believes that God will answer his prayer. He affirms the efficacy of celebrating God's power, revealed in Christ, in God's own presence and asking for it to be active in the lives of believers. And so to finish today, what has been your own experience with the power of prayer? That is, not just answered prayers, but prayer in general. And how does prayer draw us closer to God and the power offered us in Jesus? Friday, July 14. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, we read in the Acts of the Apostles, page 38 and 39, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. 
According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth, and was the anointed one over his people. End of quote. And then from the Desire of Ages, page 834 to 835, we read... The Father's arms encircle His Son, and the word is given. Let all the angels of God worship Him. That's from Hebrews 1.6. With joy unutterable, rulers and principalities and powers acknowledge the supremacy of the Prince of Life. The angel host prostrate themselves before Him, while the glad shout fills all the courts of heaven. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. Revelation 5.12 Songs of triumph mingle with the music from the angel harps, till heaven seems to overflow with joy and praise. Love has conquered. The lost is found. Heaven rings with voices in lofty strains proclaiming, Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. Revelation 5 verse 13. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. Ponder the now and not yet of the exaltation of Jesus. In what sense is Jesus already the Lord of all things, with the demonic powers subservient to him, that is, the now? And in what sense does his full reign over all things look toward the future, the not yet? As we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 24 to 28. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he who put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And question two. To what extent are we living in the light of Christ's rule over all things? Or to what extent are you living under the authority of these other powers, the fallen powers, whose authority is ebbing away anyway? How do you know which is which? And how can you get away from the forces of evil that, though certainly defeated, are still prevalent in our world? And for today's Inside Story, here's Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Three books, one answer by John Bradshaw. As a child, I had a lot of questions for which I couldn't find answers. Why did I have to confess my sins to a priest? Why should I pray to saints when Jesus could surely hear my prayer? Would God burn people in hell forever? I enjoyed going to church and I was happy to believe in Jesus. But attending church didn't clear up the questions. I attended many churches. Every church claimed to believe the Bible, but none could answer my questions. When I was 16, an older brother gave me a book. He had joined another church that did strange things. Church on Saturdays? But the change was obviously good for him. He was happy, which led me to think the book might just be worth reading. I promised to read the book, which he said was about history and prophecy, but I didn't get beyond the introduction. Several years later, he asked me if I had read it and when I told him I had not, he gave me another copy. I assured him I would read this one. This time I started on page one. I read most of it, most of page one that is. I put the book down intending to read it later, but I never got back to it. More years passed. I left New Zealand, my home country, and was living in England. On a trip to Ireland, desperate to find a meaningful relationship with God, I went to church. But as I left it, I told God I was never going to church again, until you show me the truth. When I returned to London, a package was waiting for me. 
I had asked my brother if he had any idea where I might be able to find the book that he twice had given me. I had looked in several bookstores, but hadn't been able to locate it. And here in the mail was the third copy of the book that would change my life, The Great Controversy. This time I started reading in the middle of the book, and when I got to the end I went back to the beginning and read what I had missed. I encountered the power of God's Word in a book that not only explained the deep prophecies of the Bible, but also connected me with Jesus. I called to the operator connected me with a church in London, and thus began earnest my walk with Jesus. I still read the great controversy, having found that I continue to find new blessings and insights into the plan of salvation. Outside of the Bible, no book has had a greater impact on my life. Join the Global Church in 2023 and 2024 in the mass promotion and distribution of the Great Controversy. Visit greatcontroversyproject.com for more information or ask your pastor. John Bradshaw is a speaker and director of It Is Written, an Adventist television ministry. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.